Thank you everyone for, uh, and, and thank you Dave for organizing and for the kind introduction. Uh, it's been, uh, yeah, it's always been wonderful to speak at uh, the Data Science Festival um, venues because they've been always very well organized and, and, and lots of really interesting um, uh, content going all around. So hopefully um, I'll do my best to add to that. Um, I think, um, so we, um, as, as Dave already mentioned, like the, the focus of today's talk is synthetic data and domain adaptation. Um, we do have a couple of uh, exciting announcements in case you, you, you missed that. Um, I think it'd be good to, to repeat that um, just really quickly about us, I think, because uh, we have to pay the bills. So sort of uh, shameless, varying degrees of shameless plugs. Um, I think the one that I think will be most interesting to everyone is that we're giving a giveaway of free three uh, e-copies e, e or e-books of, the, of uh, the book that I wrote, so uh, on, on generative adversarial networks. So if you're interested in some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today, uh, there is, a, there is a definitely a three, three copies that we're giving away. And, and all you have to do is just post on either Twitter or LinkedIn something that you found interesting from today's presentation and uh, tag uh, myself or, or someone from the uh, data science festival, and then we'll do a raffle for those three copies. I think there should be also a 40% discount for all both the physical and the ebook version somewhere flying around. Hopefully we, we can uh, have that in, in the chat, but um, yeah, so, so you can, you can get one for free. And if you don't get it for free, you can at least have a pretty, pretty nice discount. Um, and then um, I think one of the things I would sort of like to ask as I'm kind of just Doing, giving a brief spiel about us, I think would be good to trigger trigger the first poll just so that that I know uh, what the to get a sense of the audience. It's much harder with Zoom to really see like how much people are following or if I should you know speed up and, because what I'm saying is too 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 simple or uh, you know uh, slow down. So I think it'd be good great to great to hear um, what um, what people uh, what people uh, are. Um, where they're at in terms of their their skills and 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 uh, yeah, as I'm sort of walking through the walking through some of uh, about what we do. Um, so yeah, so um, as as Dave said, we're we're uh, called Creation Labs. Uh, we we create synthetic data for computer vision uh, with a focus focus on urban environments. Um, our our data is probably like 40 to 100 percent better than the traditional synthetic data. We'll we'll talk about what that means in a bit. And then uh, you know, uh, and and why why you might care about as well. And we have clients in robotics, smart cities, self-driving cars, um, and uh, yeah. Um, so I, I think that's probably um, you know there, there's a number of advantages. I, I won't I won't try to go into the full uh, spiel for for why you might care about it. But uh, do we have results from the first uh, from the first poll, or how would I see them? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay, so that's, uh, this is helpful to know. Yeah. Um, so, um, so I, I see there's quite a few uh, sort of junior uh, data science people, which is great. Um, I think I think one of the things that everyone kind of learns as they go from their earlier uh, years uh, is that uh, one of the key key components of uh, of uh, getting your machine learning to be valuable to a business or in, solve some valuable problem is the data, and that tends to be the first hurdle that everyone has to overcome. So I think it's good to to to, to learn that lesson uh, early. So um, like I'll, I'll move on to to, to well, what is fundamentally the computer vision problem, um, and I think maybe we can start working on the second poll if if we can, um, and so. Um, as I'm, as I'm sort of talking about the 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 issue here, which is typically um, what you, what you have is well, you know, you have some sort of deep learning. You you learned about some sort of deep learning algorithm. You know, you know that it's state of the art in in pretty much every subsection of machine of machine learning. But the challenge always tends to be how do you acquire data, and I think it's one of those perhaps underappreciated points. And I think one of my favorite slides really explaining it is is this one that I. I stole from uh, Space Machine, which is a company I, I don't think sadly uh, exists anymore. But I think they had this great piece of research, which is, um, uh, you know, uh, when you look at uh, the sort of breakthroughs in AI, 
um, anything from you know Deep Blue beating Gary Kasparov to uh, translations from uh, Google Translate or I IBM Watson's Jeopardy or ImageNet. You know the the, the algorithms are actually on average quite old. Um, by the time you hit that milestone, the average uh, age has been uh, 18 years for, for the typical when from when the first paper that proposed a certain method came about to when the actual in, you know real world milestone was accomplished. And ultimately, that's what we care about. And hopefully, we're kind of moving away from the AI hype cycle where we have a lot of AI evangelists kind of talking about how it's going to learn everything and be so much smarter than us and um, to, to the point where, um, you know, we're, we're actually delivering value. And um, obviously, uh, you know, you can make this argument that I find quite compelling that, that, that really this is largely driven by data sets. And, and when you look at, you know, the dot time from the data set to the real world breakthrough, um, you know, it's, it's usually much shorter, about three years. So that would almost suggest that the, that the, the, the like a lot of the deep learning uh, and, and in general, like machine learning revolution has been driven because not all these techniques are, are, are deep learning um, has been driven by data sets primarily and only secondarily by the algorithms, right? Because I think that people, there's lots and lots of smart people figuring out all sorts of clever ways but really like having the data in a way that they can run it and apply it to a real problem tends to be uh, the main bottleneck. Um, yeah, so um, so can can we get the second poll, please? Uh, is this, or do we, do we not have it? Um, either way, so I think, I think um, you know, obviously um, enterprises, ooh, Okay, enterprises face uh, lots of AI. Ninety-six percent of enterprises face face AI tra training issues. I don't. I don't think that uh, that needs much much explanation. It's just that it's a very prevalent problem, and almost everyone has it. Um, you know, if you if you don't hear it from me, there's lots of people like uh, Andre Kaparthi, um, who is the chief AI officer at Tesla, and they probably have the world's largest computer vision data set. But at the same time, they still struggle from a lot of these issues. Um, and so yeah, so data is very hard to to come by and get right, and and it's interesting when you think about in 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 scope of like when when most of us talk about AI and machine learning, really what we mean is the last five stages of like you know identifying exactly what the problem is, model training, tuning the model, and have parameter selection. Then I don't know I don't understand why economists put algorithm development here, but okay, I guess that what they mean is like building up the, the frameworks around it um, to, to basically make it productionized, right? productionized or operationalized. And, um, and yeah, so um, that, um, that has been, that, that tends to like comprise of what most people think about. But really like according to this, this own research, right? Like most, most time you spend like 85% of your time in uh, the cleaning, the labeling, the augmentation, uh, and, and some, some of the aggregation. And I think that's one of those things that perhaps underappreciated at, at, at like pretty much every machine learning team I've ever been part of has always had the sort of, you know, data engineers and then, and, and sort of discovery elements and, and software engineers um, I, I play a crucial role in uh, building out the capacity of, of, of data scientists and machine learning engineers to, to then you know, look at the data and then deploy it onto some real world problem. Um, and I, I would almost say that this picture as economist puts, puts it is almost in, incomplete. Like there's this acquisition step that's sort of still sort of unexplored, which sometimes you need to go out to the real world and the, with cameras and LIDAR and, and, and whatever other sensors to, to basically try to figure out like how to, how to acquire that data. Um, so why is, why is, um, why is this so challenging? Well, I think one of the key challenges is, is sourcing the right data from with the right sensors. Um, so uh, obviously you can have like all sorts of different cameras. They all will have all slightly different lenses. You'll have, you'll need to have the, okay. Um, that's uh, useful uh, to, to, to know. Um, I think we'll have uh, the, you'll have some, some sort of, labeling and some sort of sourcing of, of that, uh, of the, of the data that you get. And I think pretty much, pretty much everyone I know has always com been complaining about 
how hard is it to acquire and how hard is it to label? Because there's, there's now probably, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of data labeling companies, but pretty much everyone always, you know, need, needs to design an entire process around it, even if they're using an external agency. So you can like collect all your wonderful data and you push it out to some firm like somewhere in India or Philippines or typically because they tend to be cheaper locations. And then um, uh, you, you still pay quite a lot uh, overall because you're labeling lots of images and you almost always get the data back and you're like, this is not quite what I wanted. And then you need to design a process around it. It, it, gets, it gets a little bit tricky. Um, you know, you need to design the QA and, and all that. And then there's the step of curation and balance. And especially as, um, as uh, your, your computer vision pipeline hopefully matures, there is the step of where you're trying to basically curate the data set to be most closely aligned with your business problem to represent all the data that you want to represent and to not over represent certain cases or scenarios or, or, or data points um, and sort of balance it out carefully so that it, it sort of matches the real world performance. And then that's also a non-trivial step. Um, so one thought that you might have is like, well, I might use synthetic data to sort of balance that out. And um, that could be quite, uh, that could be quite uh, a good sort of starting point to just see like, okay, well, uh, you know, there are, well, what can I use? Well, there are these computer games that have been going for a long time. They've gotten very good in recent years at being quite close to reality. Um, obviously there's still a lot of work and effort required. So now you're basically trying to like reverse engineer reality, but it definitely has some advantages, right? So, well, if you have these 3D models, you, you, can, you can set up your own pipeline. You know, you can use Unreal, you can use Unity, you can use uh, Blender. Uh, I think these tend to be most popular. And then once you have that set up, the data generation is much cheaper. Um, and the variety that you can sort of parameterize, you can script it, you can say, you know, I'll, I'll make all these different scenes where the objects are positioned in, in certain patterns. And you can basically do like a grid search over what are all the possible combinations. You can generate even rare scenarios like, you know, that, you know, uh, a child is not going to run in front of a car very often, hopefully, but, you know, you can, you can script those harder to train, but more important scenarios. Um, uh, and then so you can, that way you can kind of create some of the balance in the, in the, in, in the sense that your data set will then represent even the tricky and problematic scenarios that you absolutely need to get right. Um, and, and then I think that's one of the key challenges is that in these mission critical um, applications, uh, there's that limitation. And of course, um, you know, because you're starting from sim simulation, you have some, some key advantages like rendering and annotations um, come, come like hand in hand. So you can get pixel perfect semantic segmentation. So like a map of what that um, image looks like. Um, the annotation strategy can be quite flexible. So you can, especially early on when you're trying to still figure out, oh, what is it that I'm trying to actually like capture? Does it make, you know, do I need to split like, you know, different parts of the, 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 the building up or can I just call it the building and just label the whole thing with a building pixel? Or do I need to like, this is a door, explain that this is a door and this is a window and so on. Um, and of course that takes uh, quite a few iterations to figure out what matters. And, and I think that's one of the, one of the key advantages. And of course, like it's sort of safe and private by design. So there's kind of come some interesting things. Um, yeah. So, so it, let's say, let's say you wanted to, to try this and say, okay, well, that seems like an interesting avenue to explore. Um, maybe I could set up my own 3D rendering pipeline and just build, you know, see how that computer vision algorithm performs. How would you test it? How would you convince yourself that this works? Well, so you, you could run an experiment. You could sort of take a computer vision game and, and uh, you know, train the semantic segmentation network. So in, in this case, like basically just, you know, having certain labels and saying, you know, this is a car and then um, this is a tree and then this is a building, right? Um, you, could, you, could, you could do that and then you can train a neural network that does the semantic segmentation that's fairly well understood task. You know, there's many, many ways to do this and, uh, and you test on real. So you take that game engine, you take the 
simulated labels that you get for free, and then you basically test on reality, like, does this help or not? Um, and then you can, you can sort of see, like, well, what if I were to do with it with real data? So you can take, you know, an open source data set, like cityscapes, but it could be anything. Um, and again, you know, a lot of these have been carefully annotated, uh, sometimes painstakingly taking, you know, to hundreds of thousands of, of people, of hours of people's time. And then you can uh, effectively do the same thing, see how that performs on that exact data set. Now, you would obviously expect that the, the sort of train, that even if you do the train test split as is best practice within machine learning, you would still expect that the second experiment would perform better um, just because is literally you're training and testing on the same data distribution. Whereas there's obviously sort of a domain or, or distribution difference between the synthetic world and the real world uh, on top of the fact that obviously in each case, there are, there, the images are completely different, um, but there now there's this extra problem of, of not just the images, individual images being different, but also the domain being different. Um, so, um, you know, as, as expected, when you run this, um, you know, when you kind of do um, uh, measure the semantic segmentation accuracy, so basically like for each pixel you measure, is that the pixel was supposed to be, yes, no, and, and so it's basically out of 100, and so we can say like, okay, um, on this particular metric, you know, when you just take cityscapes, you get somewhere um, around 80% accuracy, 85, I think. And then on, on GTA, you get somewhere like 40 to 43%. Um, and, and, you know, this kind of matches the qualitative performance. So when you, when you train uh, something on, on uh, Grand Theft Auto, which is the, the data set, the computer game that the data set came from, um, you know, it doesn't perform particularly well. Like this is the target, this is the semantic segmentation. You're trying to identify the cyclist, this road, you know, uh, the, the, the foliage and, and then the traffic uh, signs and poles. And of course the prediction is like all over the place. Like we can all agree that this is not a good prediction. Um, and whereas real on real sort of like you train on cityscapes and test it on different images from cityscapes, that, that obviously uh, tends to perform quite well. There's still some ways to go. You can see that under, around the hood of the car and sort of further out in the distance, it tends to be harder, but it generally tends to get the drivable space quite well. So that's quite a neat uh, sort of starting point. Um, all right, well, so I guess the next question is like, how could we, how could we close that domain gap? And uh, um, can we, um, can we just see how, uh, how, how, how do we, what, what sort of techniques are available for us to do that? I think maybe now is a good point to maybe trigger the third poll, just so, so we're, uh, yeah. So, um, because now we're going into the, this, this uh, generative adversarial network paradigm is, is as, a, as you might have guessed. Um, and I think it would just be good to get a sense of in the room whether how uh, carefully should we approach this? But um, yeah, so the idea, as I, as I sort of hinted at, is this that sort of the generative modeling to go to this close to sensorial gap, as it's known in the academic literature. Um, and um, so a number of people have done this. Like this is uh, on the right here. You can see a sample of, from a paper from NVIDIA where they try to basically recreate realistic um, sort of settings in the um, in 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 the simulation by using sort of scenarios that they thought were kind of easily modelable, and then they kind of closed the loop by reenacting whatever they found in the simulation in the real world. Um, so, um, can we can we see the results from the? Cool. Okay. Right. Okay. So most people, most people are in the. They haven't started too much with Yant. They have. They may might not know at all that they have read about them sometimes. But most people haven't really done much more. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So um, that's good to know. So it's basically um, the. Yeah. So so basically, you can kind of try to come up with some way of of generalizing to this other domain by by training neural network. Right. Like ultimately. 
um, it's actually not that different from semantic segmentation. It's image to image translation. You have one image in and you're trying to get another image out. Um, and so you're trying to basically just kind of remap what that simulated image would have looked like in the real world. So where are we, where are we ultimately trying to get to? We're ultimately trying to start with the same 3D pipeline that we've already discussed. And then we're trying to take a sample of the real world, sample of the real like target data distribution and, and effectively use domain adaptation to, to create photorealistic images. So um, in, in, uh, in, in our book, as well as like in the literature, I think one of the most exciting ideas is this idea of cycle GAN. Um, and uh, we can sort of start, I guess, is, is given that most people haven't really uh, heard about, or know, know too much about GANs, I think it's good to start with an analogy. So um, what GANs is, is it basically it's two neural networks one of them is the sort of dis discriminator, uh, which is basically like a detective in, in uh, trying to unravel like forgeries. And then you have the generator, which is like a forger who's trying to come up with, uh, you know, like fakes of, uh, of, of, uh, of well-known pieces of art. And, and uh, it's like a cat and mouse game between the generator who's trying to come up with more and more realistic images and the discriminator who's trying to basically distinguish like, is this real, is this fake? And, and uh, probably given that we were in the machine learning, machine learning and deep learning era, it should probably not surprise anybody that both of these are the neural networks um, that basically, you know, take a, uh, take a book from the convolutional neural network literature and um, start, you know, with, with some sort of seeding factor, like the, some sort of inspiration for the generator, then the generator produces out an image. And then the discriminator intermittently gets an image from either the generator or the discriminator and is trying to figure out which is which. So more formally, this is what it looks like. Um, so yeah, like number one here is this sort of like, you know, uh, example of, of a real training data that could be something like uh, MNIST, which is the hello world of computer vision. It's like this 28 by 28 uh, grayscale images of digits. Um, but obviously it scales up to more complex things, but that's usually what people start with. Um, and then the second step is there's this sort of latent vector, so-called, where you sample from that, um, you feed that to a generator, and the generator uses what's called a transpose convolution to basically ex expand that out to be, um, to be a, uh, of the scale, of the same, same scale and size of the image. And then, um, you basically give that to the discriminator. So the discriminator just sees two 28 by 28 matrices or more if you're using bigger batch size. Um, and, and then either it tries to make a prediction, which is real, which is fake, um, and either it gets it right, at which point, you know, the discriminator is fine, but the generator needs to learn. So you back propagate the error um, or it gets it wrong, at which point the discriminator needs to learn. And so it, that you back, back propagate that error back to the discriminator. So, so iteratively, both networks kind of get better over time. Um, yeah, so this is kind of like the core idea. Um, so if you, if you kind of break it down, right, generative, because they generate, adversarial, because they're competing against each other, and networks, because there's two of them. Um, the neat thing about discriminator is that something that, in, when you think about it, it's something that most of us already know. It's like, it's just a supervised convolutional neural network, it's, it's really like just a binary classification problem. The generator is more interesting and sort of unsupervised, or you can argue self-supervised uh, convolutional neural network that uses rather than regular convolution transpose and convolution. So you start from a smaller sample and you expand it out to be whatever the resolution that you wanted your original image be. And, and, uh, and a fun side note, one of, the, one of the sort of Easter eggs that I hidden into this presentation is that all of these transition slides, none of these animals are real. They're all fake. They've all been generated by different GAN, one we're not going to talk about today. But if you want to look it up, you can look up Big GAN. Uh, it was presented at iClear 2019, I think. Um, and, and all of these images, all of these birds, none of them exist. They're all fake. You can kind of see they look a little bit weird, some of them. Um, and, and, and if you are wondering if you're having a stroke, you're not. Um, it's just that, you know, the network's trying its best and sometimes it kind of 
looks things that look very distinctively bird-like, but uh, have have things that where there's like some sort of birds like sort of warped in a time-space continuum or so, something. Um, not sure, um, but but uh, yeah, the, it, these techniques have become quite powerful since their introduction in 2014. Um, so, um, but the one that we're going to discuss in, in greater depth today is called Cyclegan. It's quite interesting. Um, I think one of the key things that we're using here is sort of unpaired domains. So here we're going into like pretty much fully unsupervised paradigm. I guess if you're pedantic, you could argue that there's some degree of supervision, but um, um, but uh, yeah. So 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 that you have two domains, um, like you know, a painting and a real world, or, or vice versa, or zebras and horses, or summer summer and winter and winter to summer. And, and you can basically train this generative model to translate from one domain onto the other. So hopefully you're starting to see where I'm kind of going with this argument that you can eventually use this for sim to real. Um, but, uh, but obviously it's no longer as simple as that image of the cycle GAN, oh, sorry, of the original, like, of, I think that was a uh, non-saturating GAN um, that, uh, that you guys saw on the slide earlier. Um, but I mean, in principle, like now, like at least on a on high level, like the idea of translating one domain A to another domain B is quite powerful. So how do we do that? Well, so we start with some input image. And, and in this case, uh, you know, what else to compare about apples and oranges? Um, so um, you start with some uh, sort of input image, and then you sort of run this, you run the first set of discriminators. So now you have two pairs of discriminators and two pairs of generators. So um, you, you start with that um, first image and you evaluate the discriminator and that way you get the decision, is this real or fake? Obviously because that is the original image, in the A domain, this should still be real. Then you use the first set of uh, generator, which is the generator that maps from domain A to domain B, so from apples to oranges, and, and then you evaluate it again. Hopefully this time your discriminator will tell you that this is not real and <laughs> that um, you should, uh, that, that this is fake because you've translated it from that original A domain which was, what was originally an A picture into the B domain, into an orange domain, which is not a B picture. And then um, ultimately you get a, you get a, you get a, a sort of translation back from, from, from domain B, from oranges to, to apples, and that way you get a reconstruction of that original image. The reconstruction is quite powerful because um, you can then measure the original input and the reconstructed output, and that gives you a cycle. Um, so, um, like the same way you might, the same way you might uh, have sort of uh, test your translator uh, by giving them a sentence from English to French and then from French to English. Um, if those two sentences don't uh, don't end up being quite similar, then then you know your two translators are probably quite uh, disagree or are quite bad. So I think that way you can kind of measure the performance of like how well you're doing, which is a really neat idea because it doesn't require you mo more knowledge than the fact that there are two domains and which image belongs in which domain. Um, so how I think I think sometimes people people get confused by how is it even possible to have a generator. Typically, this is not something that's not very extensively covered in most machine learning courses because people tend to like always think of, of neural networks as this linear flow towards smaller and smaller number, number of uh, well, smaller and smaller resolution with increasing number of channels, the way you ultimately get some sort of classification decision or maybe bounding box decision or something similar. Um, here, the degenerative problem is a little bit more interesting in the sense that you frequently need to go down to, to sort of some shared representation. So this this sort of, if you don't think about the second, the right half of the picture, the, the left half should be fairly similar to, to what a normal convolutional neural network looks like. You, you have them some sort of, uh, sort of three channel resolution, and then you kind of start distilling that down to some like lots of channels uh, about very small resolution. And then you start, start upscaling with these transposed convolutions that I talked about earlier which is just a way of sort of up learning the upsampling from a smaller resolution to higher resolution. The one neat trick, um, and then sort of this sort of 
residual connection idea, which is quite popular um, ever since ResNet came out, both in supervised and in GAN literature, um, is this idea of resolution connect, uh, residual connection. So you basically kind of add in the detail because obviously as you losing resolution and increasing channels, you're, uh, you're losing the detail. So you're adding the detail back in, but again, that's learned. So, so uh, you have the network can sort of play around with the parameters and figure out how to best upscale it so that you have a high resolution apple at the other end from that orange that preserves the scene and the semantics and the, the geometry sort of the layout. Um, but at the same time, it does change the orange or just changes the zebra. Um, so here you can then, you know, bring it all the way back to the, the, the sort of synthetic data idea. And here we're kind of like skipping, skipping ahead a little bit, but you know, you can sort of try to see, okay, so when we evaluate cityscapes, we get the 86% accuracy. When we just do renders, we get about 42. And when we sort of train the sim to real cycle GAN, we get about 55, 52% uh, left. Um, it's still far from, from real data. I think you can kind of see um, that it's obviously better than, than uh, the original GTA, but uh, you know, the, the, like still lots of very important issues have been missed. Like the sidewalk here um, has been completely missed. That, that's a very serious problem. Um, and, and obviously the, the label around this, these edges tend to be uh, missed as well. I think the drivable space team seems to be detected more or less okay, but the, the, the sidewalk is a big issue. Um, so these are the, the examples of these domain translated images. So here we start with some um, GTA example. Uh, and you, if you've ever played GTA or watched videos of it, um, you can still make it out that this is obviously where, where this was taken, but now it has this like dreamy hallucinogenic kind of vibe to it. Um, that is quite common with, with translation networks. Um, I think typically um, there's lots of research in the literature that neural networks tend to focus more on the texture than they do on the actual, um, on the actual sort of geometry, uh, much to, to uh, a lot of people's surprise. So what's important here is that you added the right texture and haven't changed the geometry too much because um, if you did, then you know the network itself will be quite confused. You need to sort of implicitly have the right texture at the right place. So one way to compare that is like then to compare back to the back to the semantic map, and it seems that it's doing that quite well. So we could see where the improvement likely comes from. So. We start working on, on this in, in a while. So I think it's just kind of an interesting uh, sort of note where, where you can take these. And, and, uh, and one of the things that we worked really hard is, is try to make sure that you kind of take this sort of domain adaptation to a place where it looks quite, quite realistic. Um, and hopefully you can kind of see that you, you know, we got rid of a lot of this weird texturing, a lot of these like weird dreamy artifacts and the sort of blended the, the, the image uh, much better together, um, made the cars less shiny. I think you can kind of see here that the cars are very distinctly like a different object, which, which helps the network quite a bit. Um, the trees and the foliage tends to be much more realistic. You can, uh, foliage and, and trees in general tend to be a big problem in computer vision, oh, sorry, in computer graphics for a long time because they're very complicated trees and uh, trees and, uh, and and sort of uh, roots and, and leaves like all these organic things tend to be quite difficult to model because 3D artists are ex you know expensive they don't want to spend hundreds of hours on a single plant on the corner of a scene but nature doesn't care nature is going to make it very complicated um, and so I think that's one of the things that domain adaptation does quite well the the you can also notice that the sh the 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 sort of street uh, texture and the road texture is much more European because the sample of the data is European, but also it's much more realistic. Um, and and you know indeed it turns out that you can you can get effective performance that's comparable. Um, and and because you now have more data, um, you, can, you can you can you can even surpass on the same 
test set, the, the fixed test set that you always had, you can even surpass that performance uh, as measured by semantic uh, segmentation accuracy. And you can kind of see that the prediction of domain adapted on uh, Unreal is, is quite good. Um, I, I don't see any major thing on the prediction that I would be, yeah, I mean, sure, there's like corners that could be better, but that's almost always the case, even with the real network, like here, right? The network also gets, even the real Unreal network gets uh, get some things wrong. So I, I think it, it tends to like generally get, get pretty, pretty good performance. Um, so, I mean, here's just a breakdown. I, I mean, typically this is just for the, for the, for the, for the tr true hardcore computer vision nerds. Um, so this is the per class breakdown of, of the performance. Um, you know, here you can see that on every class where we're comparable, um, sometimes we're a little, little better. Usually it's about as good as our, our, um, or generally comparable. Um, this is a different metric, uh, one that favors a um, little bit more like capturing each class separately. So, so it, it sort of favors um, sort of identifying objects over just raw accuracy because if, you know, 80% of your picture is road, the network will learn very quickly that just predict road and you'll be right 80% of the time. So this, the, the MIOU metric, which is quite common in, in segmentation, literature, um, it tends to fit, like sort of penalize that a little bit. And, and, and here you can see that, you know, the performance that does drop, but it's still very similar to, to the, to the, the original, um, performance on just real on real. Um, like other reasons why the, the, the sort of synthetic data could be interesting, especially for detecting like the sort of weather than damaged assets. So we have we have done some prototypes around like detection of like potholes and 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 generally like uh, I think if if you are thinking about applying domain adaptation to your own company or in your own projects, one thing that could be quite interesting is you know hey can we make this uh, can we can we maybe solve some of the sort of natural damage and natural weathering that we see around that's quite hard to model with computer like with computer graphics like you can do it but it just takes takes a long time to, 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 to get the assets exactly right. Um, yeah, so just some closing thoughts um, and uh, happy to answer any questions afterwards. Um, I think one of, the, one of the things that we're quite excited by is that this idea of, of sort of localization. So this is full disclosure, this is not our work. Uh, this is just a really cool paper from NVIDIA um, where they basically took samples from different places around the world, like Germany, cities, uh, like this is cityscapes, pretty sure. Um, then, then they took like, um, I think this is Berkeley Deep Drive, and I'm not sure what these other two data sets are, but they took different, uh, different uh, data sets from around the world, and they fed them the same exact sort of underlying geometry, um, and, and they resynthesized in that style. And you can see that the network has learned like to, to create like sun near San Francisco and sort of like somewhat gloomy, but like more, more American looking New York. And, uh, you know, uh, like if, if you wanted more, more foliage, like you can get sort of more outdoorsy data sets. So I think there's an interesting application of like using the same simulation, the same geometry, but, you know, applying samples from around the, the world. And so if you notice that your computer vision algorithms, there's a domain gap between, uh, between, um, America and Europe, and I know quite a few companies that had had this problem and, and then had a hair on fire sort of issue where they like needed to solve it somehow because they just thought, oh, it's computer vision, it'll just work in America the same way it did in Europe and totally doesn't. Um, so, um, so yeah, so, so that way you can sort of at least narrow the gap between, between uh, the two domains. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think um, this is just some, something that, um, we're, 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 we're kind of not touching at the moment, but I know quite a few people working on this. So I think it's kind of interesting to mention, especially given that, uh, you know, medical applications of machine learning are quite, uh, quite popular these days. Um, this can absolutely be applied in, in medical domain as well. Um, you know, so, so like companies like Kiron, um, so this is from their paper, um, have used this to like synthesize 
um, all sorts of like mammo like full full spectrum digital mammograms and 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 people have pretty much any type of medical data. Uh, I think I think uh, people have applied this too. Um, and so it's quite interesting. I think from there, they 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 personally have the story of where you can uh, where they gave this to radiologists at some like top American radiology conference, and all except like three couldn't really tell the difference between the real and, and synthetic. So humans are quite bad at telling those two apart. I think that makes sense. I think there's there's a couple of reasons why that uh, why that probably is the case, but we can go into that later. Um, just some other examples. I mean, these are just like great prototypes that we have that I've kind of been building on the side for fun. Um, you know, just making like aerial shots more realistic or translating day uh, to night. Um, you, you know, another like uh, sim to real example where I was kind of like seeing like how far I can push it, how bad, how old school can the render be and still get decent results at least some of the time. And then the last one here is uh, just a, kind of a texturing application where we just wanted to see like, okay, like if we get a 3D model of just the rough texture of a landscape, like can we texture it? Can we add like Scottish Highlands texture? Um, to it, and turns out you can. I think there's the, the geometry is slightly wonky, but uh, but you can definitely have some decent looking results. Um, yeah, so there's some references in in case you want to take a screenshot. Um, there's uh, there's definitely lots and lots of great stuff on the internet uh, out there. It's open source, so so definitely recommend checking that out. Um, yeah, and I think that's uh, that's kind of it. So happy to take any questions. Bring it on mute, David. Yeah. I join every Zoom meeting and just start talking, and it's the exact same thing. So uh, I'm hoping everyone has done the same thing at one point or another. So, uh, mate, if I just get you to stop sharing, um, actually, before you stop sharing your slides, I did notice one of these questions actually uh, related to a specific slide. Uh, so we might go to Tommy's question first, uh, and then we'll jump into the other questions from there. So I think this related to slide 19. Um, so maybe if you could just quickly flick to slide 19. I, I hope I've uh, taken a note of that properly. Yeah, that was it, mate. Yeah, that perfect. So Tommy was just asking, uh, do you use discriminator A on generator G underscore BA output? Does that make sense to you, ma'am? Yes. Um, good question. So um, you you so I can think one thing that I kind of skimmed over here is that there's this, this cycle and then there's the, the other half of the cycle, if that makes sense. So you do, but not in this cycle. So you have, because uh, you go from A to B to A, and then you give, gives you reconstructed A, um, but, you, but at the same time you're training the network B to A to reconstructed B, if that makes sense, Tommy. So, so you kind of get uh, reconstructions both ways. And then in, in that other cycle, you would, you would apply the discriminator for for that translated and then reconstruct uh, for for the initial and then the recon translated. Fantastic. Hopefully that answers the question. If not, uh, happy to. He's got. He's got, your, to, he's to got your Twitter. He's got your LinkedIn. It'll be Tommy. Will be coming after you. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah that, that, I mean, we're even on the same Slack, so I think I think uh, happy to answer there or or publicly or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's, yeah. Good. Good man. Uh, mate, so yeah, I think you can stop sharing your slides uh, and then we'll jump into a bit more of a sort of natural just Q&A back and forward between us. Uh, first question that came in actually was from Hamid. Um, I think you did go on to discuss a few more use cases and stuff as we went on, but um, Hamid was basically saying, do you think in general there's a shortage of clean data uh, to train models? Do you think it's particular use cases in particular that this is, I guess, most relevant for? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question. I think... Um, so in general, I would say there definitely is a shortage of that like ideal clean data sets pretty much anywhere, right? Um, I think there is an open question and I think that's kind of what, what it was alluding to is like, does this, this seems like a lot of work. Is this worth, you know, if I have my own problem and I wanted to like do this, that like at what point uh, isn't it just easier to just send out like, 
20 interns or 20 like uh, people from TaskRabbit with the world with GoPros and just go and collect that data that way. I think that's a fair question. Um, I think, uh, you know, it will depend slightly on your problem. I think uh, in general, I think there's mission critical application, um, especially for autonomous systems, whether that's drones, self-driving cars or robots, where you probably want to use simulation anyway, because it you want to kind of uh, sort of test it. And so then domain adaptation would naturally fit on top of that. So synthetic data there is like a good proposition. Um, you know, if, if you have, if you're doing something that's fairly like static, right, you're trying to um, determine something that, that where it doesn't like the errors don't matter too much. If you're like just trying to do like, you know, uh, customer analytics, on like CCTV, right? Like you and and it really doesn't matter if you like every now and again, you know, uh, or like sort of age someone incorrectly or uh, gender someone incorrectly. Like that, you know, it tends to average itself out. Uh, and so, uh, you know, these types of applications probably does make sense to build a full like simulation of a mall just to get this uh, data. You there's probably easier and cheaper and faster ways to get it. Um, I think medical is another interesting area. I did mention that because I think uh, a lot of people are playing around with synthetic data for medical applications. I think there's other challenges with it, but just because it can be so expensive to get certain types of data. Um, and even then you get only very limited amounts. And especially if you're looking for like really rare diseases or tissue patterns or whatever, then uh, it can be quite hard to collect it naturally. So um, I think that tends to be a good area, but yeah, definitely like it's worth thinking about is there an easier way to solve it? Because this is not a solution that, that that's like, you know, optimal for, for every problem. Okay, well, that makes sense, definitely, thank you. Uh, next question from Adam, uh, he's saying, uh, domain adaption looks like a powerful way to stylize images. Uh, why can't we use style transfer or, you know, simpler existing techniques? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that that's, it's an important question. I think it's always good to ask, ask yourself, like, are there, is there a simple way uh, to do this. Um, so I think one of the, the reasons why domain adaptation is quite useful is like, well, you, you want to have a learned uh, mapping. It's, it's style transfer is very good at generating pretty images, but you, what you can't just do is, is uh, it, it still relies a lot of human fine tuning. So human needs to be very heavily involved in like figuring out at the end of the day, you almost never get sim to real uh, style transfer you almost always have to have a learned mapping. You need to learn what that mapping should look like and domain adaptation is perfect tool for that. Uh, because otherwise you, you, you might spend, you know, like hundreds of hours trying to figure out what exactly is the, the setup of hyperparameters so that you get a realistic looking output and then it will break down completely in an in, in, in a adjacent scenario. So, um, so yeah, so style transfer is great for artistic purposes when you just care, like, does it look cool? Uh, but for anything where you want to like, it needs to look real, it, it's quite difficult. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to jump around through these questions a little bit. I'm conscious of time. I just want to make sure it kind of flows a little bit. So uh, I'm going to jump down to a question from Alexi. Um, and he's talking about in terms of domain adaption uh, that you've demoed there, GTA to real. Uh, what what mm -hmm. was the compute time like? Uh, how much compute time do you need, GPU days, uh, to get that sort of cityscape performance? Is it quite heavy? Yeah, correct. I think that was like, I think that particular model was around 12, 13 hours on eight GPUs. Um, so, I mean, you know, whether that's a little or a lot depends whether you're, you're a small startup or Google. For Google, it's nothing. For for startup, it could it'd probably be around, in, in terms of like AWS costs on spot instances, it'll probably be around like 100 bucks, I would say. Cool. Uh, and then I'll, I'll stick with a couple of quite specific questions. And then there's a few general questions coming in about the, you know, where things are going and stuff like that. So again, another question from Alexi. Um, he was talking or asking, uh, how stable is convergence while training? Any issues to be aware of? Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, so generally, I, it was interesting. I've, uh, I've had this question earlier today. Uh, for someone else. Um, but uh, yeah, I think in general it tends to be because um, you're starting with a simulation, it tends to be quite stable. 
So I'm happy to elaborate more offline of, of, of or after the call, but in principle, um, you know, typically people are worried about mode collapse when it comes to GAN. Um, and, and I think I'll go into that in the other presentation I gave at Data Science Festival, but here it's not a problem specifically because you're starting with an entire image, whereas originally the, in the, uh, the GAN sample, you just start with this like 100 numbers and you start with that 100 numbers and you're trying to come up with something original, that's hard. But if you're starting with an image and you're like, make it more real, that's much more reasonable and it's much harder, right? It's almost, it's not, it's not exactly impossible. Like I've managed to, to muff that up sufficiently enough to get mode collapse, even in this setup, but it's much, much harder uh, than in the, in the typical GAN setup. Uh, so, so you can, you, you, like it, it's almost in the way that this pro the, the the problem is defined that you start with a simulation makes it very stable by by kind of by design. Okay, thank you. Um, next question we'll take from uh, Manny. Uh, Manny's asking how would you measure the bias you are adding or removing by introducing synthetic data to your experiments uh, compared to real existing data? Hmm. Mm. And and I guess I mean I guess it depends on 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 what kind of bias we're because like I guess there's like the what statisticians say when they uh, what would they mean when they say bias and there's like what most people mean when they say bias and there's like the statistical definition of bias is a little bit different than the like you know the the definition of bias you'd find in the AI ethics literature so I think that they they are quite different. Uh, if it's okay, can you, Manny, can you maybe ask that question again and clarify what exactly you meant? Because, uh, I, I mean, I, I want to answer, I just don't know, don't know where, where exactly you're kind of going with it. Right, we'll see if Manny comes back. We've got five minutes, Manny. You're on the clock, mate. So send in this another question. Um, next question is a little bit more uh, general. Um, again, it was actually Manny that asked this question, so he's doing well here, back to back. Um, he said, you've covered a lot of stuff. Um, you know, is there a recommended starting point? I, I would guess your book would probably be the recommended starting point, eh? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think that could be a good point. I mean, I, I don't want to just, just like keep plugging the stuff that I do. I think, I think in general, there's a lot of great stuff on, um, on uh, GitHub. I think, uh, I think there's a lot of, a lot of great uh, resources uh, also, like papers with code, I think that's uh, it's an, another sort of uh, like a uh, London-based company. They're they're quite they're very talented, and they, they kind of just kind of grab all the data science, knowledge, like machine learning knowledge, and try to make sense of it. So, if you're looking for a good place to start, like I would recommend that because it's like a wiki for for that, which is quite nice. nice. Um, Mate, thanks for that. It's nice to it's nice to share the knowledge there. It's good. Um, the next question uh, came in from Hamad, and I must admit it was one I was thinking as you were talking, and he's talking about the, I guess the future uh, of GANs and AI in general, and uh, I'm not sure if it was him or if I've just made it up myself, but in terms of the ethics mm. of some of this stuff as well, there's clearly mm. used cases for good, there's potentially uh, ways that this could be used in a bad way as well. Um, you know. Mm the future of this looking like how do you think it's going to impact society both in a good and a bad way right yeah i mean so i think there's like the, the ethics of like synthetic data there's the ethics of of gans and there's the ethics of ai i think ethics of ai i probably won't even attempt to tackle i think it's, it's too much i think um i think if we take the middle level just so that we're not focusing just on synthetic data i think gans in general like Obviously, I have really interesting artistic applications, creative applications, um, you know, in synthetic data and visual, like creating visual, like virtual worlds that are quite realistic, you know, AR, VR, movies, games, uh, synthetic data, all those types of things. Um, so I think obviously that, that that's useful. I think the problem is, you know, as we get worse at, um, you know, distinguishing uh, what's real, what's fake, like that, that could, that could be somewhat concerning. I think in my head, I think there's two things that I think in, important to mention, uh, on, on the sort of abuse of these techniques. I think there's, um, there's, uh, like, first of all, at least currently the state of the art in, in deep fake detection, which is probably one of the, again, deep fakes is not all bad, but it's probably the most, uh, what most people think about when they think about generative 
modeling. And also not all deep fakes are GANs, but um, that I, I won't go into that. Um, it's, um, yeah, so, so I think I, I can understand why people would be uh, concerned about this. Currently, uh, though, it seems quite easy uh, to train a machine learning model that e even when humans can't tell apart what's real and what's fake, a machine learning model can. So, so far, that seems to be a, a potential way to solve it. And then um, there is, um, yeah, I, I, I guess on the, I think the other thing I would say is that, like, you know, people fall prey to, to, to fake news that are much, much less complicated than having your own entire GPU set up, right? Cleaning and assembling your data and like, you know, basically making a month long project if you don't know what you're doing, possibly even longer, right? You can just write some articles submitted to some less reputable source and, you know, you can generate fake news very easily that way. So I don't know if we really need deep fakes for that, but yeah. You know, uh, basically your answer was people are stupid. Uh, they're going to fall for anything rather than this. Why well, go to the effort? Mate, no, that makes makes sense. Um, Manny's come back uh, again. Actually, he he's basically said he wants to know from both angles, but I think primarily he was talking more from the statistical uh, side of things in terms of the bias. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I, I would say, yeah, I think that uh, it's still quite like it's. Uh, I think that's like a really good question because it's like just on the cutting edge of what we're trying to figure out. Uh, so there's a bunch of good papers from I, uh, International Conference on Computer Vision, IICV, in Korea last year um, that, that dealt with that question specifically. Um, it was, um, yeah, so, so I think in, in general, like you are pro definitely introducing some, some amount of bias um, into it because you're replicating the patterns that you've already seen. I think as you get bigger, uh, bigger, uh, model and bigger data set to train your domain adaptation on that data set event the dead bias eventually goes to zero um i think um yeah but the, there's definitely like a degree of of sort of like like you're, you're assuming that 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 the the that, that, that you've correct collected the right data set right like what it's not really sh the solving completely is this idea of like oh we're just gonna like uh make every situation that you've generated in the simulation look photorealistic, even if we've never captured that situation in the real world. Like that's that's a that's a bit of a steep ask. It will try to come up with the best answer, but it will it'll be biased towards the situations that it's already seen. Um, so yeah, I, like as you get as you get collect more more data, and and the good thing is that you can collecting unlabeled data tends to be easier, so you can probably just get around it that way. Perfect. Uh, mate, we tried to keep these things to one hour um, and we've gone just slightly over. So if you can answer this next question in like 30 seconds, uh, that'd be cool. But it's from Shruti um, and they were asking, is there anything that springs to mind from the public sector? Is there any use cases that spring to mind in the public sector? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. I think every time I have a talk on Gans, people always ask me on, 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 uh, on applications. And I think this is, a, this is one application. I think specifically synthetic data, I think, uh, you know, you could maybe do like, you know, some sort of diff like differentially private social distancing, uh, you know, detection, something like that. Uh, I don't know if there's anything specific to public sector. I think in general, like when, anytime you have a CCTV system, for example, I'm guessing that's probably the most common in public sector. Uh, and you want to have something that doesn't use real people and is private, then synthetic data could be an interesting way. Um, yeah. Mate, that was brilliant. Uh, we've, uh, we've smashed through those questions. We've kept it to just about an hour. So uh, from my perspective, absolutely fantastic. R really, really enjoyed that. Um, my mind was blown in certain places. And uh, mate, you've done a great job with the questions. You always get the content ac across in a really uh, nice and informative way, which is great. And um, thanks to all you guys for joining us uh, as well. Um, really appreciate it. Really appreciate the interactive. So if you have enjoyed it, uh, please do just give us a little tweet or shout on uh, LinkedIn or whatever. Same for Jakob. Uh, obviously for giving up his time so uh, thank you very much Jakob uh, I don't know if there's anything you want to finish with just before we go no I think it's uh, I just want to thank you for uh, for inviting me it's been a pleasure thank you so much oh, man. thanks everyone we'll see you next week okay bye bye, Take care. bye, -bye.